brilliant idea. Pack tons of gunpowder underneath Confederate lines at Petersburg and blow a hole that the Union Army could pour through. But in Grant's memoirs, he said it was a stupendous failure. We'll find out what happened at the Battle of the Crater with our guest Kevin Levin when we return on Civil War Talk Radio. Aren't you taking Susan out tonight for a drive in the car? Yeah, Dad. Is this the talk? You know, when you're young and reckless, living life in the fast lane, you tend to overlook matters of protection. Are we talking about... Son, I just want you to remember your rubber. Dad! And get your rubber at Hilltop Tire Center. Hilltop Tire Center? What are you talking about? I know this isn't generally discussed, but it's very important to get the right rubber, say Dunlop. From Hilltop Tire Center? Yes. And with their knowledge of all the brands and sizes available, (laughs) they're sure to get the right fit. In fact, Hilltop Tire Center would probably recommend that you look at Dunlop. Dunlop? Yes, I think Dunlops have the best grip. <laughs> well, say you're going hot and heavy down some dangerous curves. You hit a bumper tube, you're looking yeah. at a head-on. Uh, what the... World Talk Radio, bringing the world to you. To reach a show host or guest during the live show, dial toll-free in North America, 866-613-1612. Or, if outside the USA and Canada, dial 001-858-268-3068. Welcome back to Civil War Talk Radio. I'm Jerry Prokopovich, talking today with Kevin Levin, high school history teacher and research or on writer on the Battle of Crater, among other subjects. Before we get back to our discussion, and we're going to talk about that battle, um, I will reiterate, as I said at the beginning of the opening segment, the legal disclaimer about my employer, East Carolina University, not being responsible for anything on the show, especially for the commercial that was played between the two breaks, between the two segments uh, just now. Uh, for a mythical tire store. It was pretty funny, <laughs> but uh, I don't think you... I, I can't tell you, see you, that's what I'm going about advertising here. So, uh, and, and those uh, those commercials are still waiting to be replaced by real commercials for important products. Uh, in the meantime, we continue to be a listener-supported service. But enough of that. Back to the 19th century, back to <laughs> history. Uh, Kevin, you wrote an article in the magazine America's Civil War in the May 2006 issue on the Battle of the Crater. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Um, I'm going to apologize and, and say up front, uh, I have not read the article. I don't get that particular magazine. Mm-hmm. Our university library doesn't have it. And when I went to the local bookstore to get it, it turns out, although the calendar says uh, June, as we're recording this today, the magazine rack thinks it's already late July, and I could not find uh, a copy. So you tell me, um, well, let's start with the beginning about the Battle of the Crater. Most of our listeners have certainly heard of it. Uh, give us a quick outline of what happened there. Well, I think the place to start in, in thinking about the Battle of the Crater, the battle itself took place on July 30th of 1864. Um, I, I guess the place to start is um, is in May of 1864. The two armies are are, are fighting it out uh, in the wilderness, and then, of course, afterwards at Spotsylvania Cold Harbor. Um, heavy casualties all along the way, of course, for both sides. And by June, uh, Grant makes the decision, uh, along with Meade, to cross the army, uh, cross the James River, and uh, onto the rail hub of Petersburg uh, in hopes of um, taking control of a of a city that, of course, um, is a railroad hub um, to uh, force, uh, I guess, the, the rest of Lee's army out of Richmond and perhaps to, to end the war. Um, just to sort of bring this you know, brief overview to a close, um, a couple of attacks take place in mid-June to take Petersburg, which fail, and the armies commence with the digging of a complex chain of uh, trenches uh, I should say that uh, along with this, I think it's important to keep in mind what's happening uh, away from Petersburg, uh, two important things at least. Uh, one, of course, is um, Jubal Early operating uh, close to Washington unsuccessfully uh, in terms of uh, moving into Washington, but operating nonetheless um, uh, in northern Virginia and, of course, in Maryland. And I think the other thing to keep in mind uh, as, as June um, moves into July um, is the presidential election that's looming 
uh, in the future, in November. And I think those things are important to keep in mind. My research on the crater has, for the most part, focused on um, the Confederate perspective uh, on this battle. And those two things are clearly, if you read the letters, um, on their minds. Uh, by the end of, uh, of June of 1864, uh, there is, um, uh, in Robert Potter's Union uh, Brigadier General Robert Potter, his second division, uh, there's a regiment, the 48th Pennsylvania, commanded by Colonel Henry Pleasance. And, uh, and his unit is situated uh, about 100 yards from um, a Confederate position, a position that sort of juts out, a salient, if you will. And uh, they convince the higher-ups to allow them to commence digging a tunnel um, underneath the Confederate position. And that starts at the end of June, and digging, digging continues uh, into the third week of July, uh, when they finally begin packing it in, I think, upwards of four tons of explosives. And early on the morning of July 30th, uh, they, of course, set that off. Uh, and what follows is uh, a Union attack involving uh, four divisions, including, of course, uh, the 4th Division, which is uh, commanded by Brigadier General Edward Ferraro uh, of the United States that includes uh, United States Colored Troops, uh, the battle ends uh, as a decisive Confederate victory. It involves um, a very well-known Confederate counterattack, which took place around 9 a.m., uh, led by William Mahone. Uh, and by 2, two o'clock in the afternoon, roughly, um, the times are difficult to get straight, but clearly by 2 o'clock the Confederates had managed to, uh, to patch up that salient. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, and we can... If you want to follow it up, I can. Well, yeah, let's, that's, that's a very good uh, summary. Gets us all on the same page now. I, I thought it was an interesting point you made about the uh, the historical context of this battle. I, when one thinks of the the summer of 1864, the maneuvering between Grant and Lee that ends with the the trenches of Petersburg, mm -hmm. that things settle down into a stalemate. But I, I think it's a very valid point to consider that other things are still going on. That's right. And you suggest from the Confederate perspective. They must be thinking uh, this war is still theirs for the winning very much. If I think that I couldn't agree more with that. I couldn't agree. Uh, couldn't agree more with that. Um, I think we have a tendency to see the final year of the war, this sort of post uh, Gettysburg uh, time frame, as uh, sort of involving some kind of inevitable decline, uh, at least for Confederate armies uh, in uh, in the East, in Virginia. And I th I think that couldn't be further from the truth. And I think if you look at, if you take a very close look, and you look at sources from the war itself, letters and diaries, newspaper articles, I think you get a very different picture of what the war looks like from uh, a Confederate perspective. Um, so many people, just to take the early example for a minute, uh, you read more general accounts of the campaign, and, you know, Early is moving on to Washington, he's unsuccessful, and then you really don't hear about it. Uh, but Confederates follow Early very closely, and it's not, it doesn't matter in the end whether he actually takes Washington. I think few people probably believed he could, uh, but that he's threatening um, major cities uh, in the north, Washington, perhaps Baltimore, uh, that he's able to collect supplies and send things back to an army that, that obviously needs those supplies, uh, that matters a great deal. So. And I think the other point to keep in mind, and, I, and this is a point that's made by uh, Tracy Power in his book um, uh, on the Army of Northern Virginia, that the longer the war continues, um, and as you get closer to the November election, perhaps there's still a chance from that Confederate perspective. Uh, so I think that's uh, – I, I, I agree with your, your observation um, in terms of what the war looks like in, in the summer of 1864. And I think the other thing is that we tend to think of the Petersburg campaign, uh, we, don't, we don't slice it up. We, we sort of refer to the Petersburg campaign as, as one, um, one big engagement. You know? it, it, we don't really distinguish between, or perhaps we don't do it uh, well enough, we don't distinguish between individual battles. But clearly the crater, uh, if you read Confederate accounts following the crater, clearly they, they saw this battle as a decisive victory, and for a number of reasons, they had a great deal of hope um, in terms of how the war might, might turn out. So the, uh, this also helps explain why Grant and the Union hierarchy is willing to undertake this expedient. They can't just 
they don't have the confidence we do reading about it that, well, of course they're going to win in the end. Just mm-hmm. all you got to do right. is, is a, a trip the enemy down and be patient, and Sherman will come marching through and just just wait it out. They can't wait it out. They need to do something. That's right. And I think Grant sees that clearly. Um, I mean, I think he really does see the war. Um, and this is his brilliance, it seems to me, that he sees the war as, as an extension of politics. Uh, I'm, I'm actually rereading uh, Brooke Simpson's book on Grant, which I think is wonderful. And he, and he, he makes this point throughout um, the sections on the war itself. And I think it's an important point to keep in mind. Well, let's look at, at the battle itself then. The, uh, the explosion works as planned, but not much else goes as planned from the Union point of view. Um, there was a, a last-minute change of plans, was there not, in how they, right. they organized this? The original plan called for Ferrara's 4th Division to lead the assault, and, uh, and they had been training for the operation <clears throat> uh, for, I think, a couple weeks. And, and they were the, the unit with the, the USCT, the color. That's right. That's right. Ferrara's 4th um, Division. Okay. I think there were nine uh, actual regiments within that division, um, two brigades. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were training to once they had anticipated the, the crater itself, and they were training to skirt the outer edges of the crater. The idea was to move as quickly as possible, move on to Cemetery Hill, which is situated, I think, about 1,000 yards. I might have that wrong, but I think about 1,000 yards beyond. And once that's a high position, uh, and then once you have that position, you can see Petersburg, and uh, one assumes the city is for the taking. The last minute, um, the order is changed. Um, the high command changes it. Meade and Mead is worried uh, about the possible ramifications if, if the uh, unit meets with stiff resistance and perhaps some of them are slaughtered. Uh, what are the political ramifications I guess he's concerned with? And so he's told to, to remove that unit. Uh, not that they can't include it, but it will not take the lead. And the three remaining divisions are uh, the, the commanders are uh, brought together, and they decide by drawing straws. Unfortunately, it's the 1st Division Commander, Brigadier General James Ledley, uh, who, who, uh, who is given the responsibility of leading this assault. Um, he is, I think by most accounts, considered to be an incompetent uh, general. Um, let, let me stop you there sure. before we get on to uh, tearing apart Ledley a little bit. Um, the, the decision not to send in Ferraro's division first, mm-hmm. one argument is that it was because, as you said, the... If, it, if there is a fiasco and the, the United States colored troops are, are sent in and they're slaughtered, it will look as though they've been sent to the slaughter. That's right. Is there a counter-argument that they were not sent in because it would not be appropriate for them to get the glory if this was a great success? Has that argument been made? I, that's what I haven't come across. I mean, that's not to say it hasn't been made. Or, or have you found any evidence for it? Let me put it no. that way. No. Um I'm just thinking, and I, I can't think of it, any any other examples. That that's the the standard account. Um, but yeah, that, I can't really speak to that. So so we'll we'll stay with the hypothesis that Meade is told, or, or Meade decides, don't let these people go first. So then then by a random draw, we find uh, General Ledley going first. That's right. And um, from all accounts, he doesn't even uh, move in. Uh, to the area once the explosion takes place with his unit. He's found uh, drinking uh, the morning away in a bomb-proof. Um, so I, I think it's a mistake to say that the, the attack itself, that, that it's inevitably going to be a failure. Um, clearly, uh, the planning is not there. Part of the problem um, is that there really is no oversight from the top down. Uh, Burnside is given a great deal of control. He, from his perspective, he doesn't really take sufficient control over the three divisions. I think the the example of just allowing them to draw straws is is sufficient um, for that observation. But um, it quickly does um, go wrong once the units move into the actual crater itself. Uh, How big is the crater? The crater, uh, you get different numbers, but 150 to 200 feet long, 60 feet wide, and at its deepest, uh, 30 feet deep. There are five South Carolina regiments under the command of Stephen uh, Elliott, South Carolina regiments that are um, torn apart. I think 278 are, are killed as a result of the explosion itself. There's also uh, a small battery uh, under the command of uh, Pegram. 
uh, Richard Pegram, and they suffer horrendous casualties. And this is probably their, their, their best chance of success right after the explosion. Unfortunately, they had failed to dig or to build um, a way out of, these are the Union soldiers, a way out of the Union trenches uh, to get into the ground to move onto the crater itself. Uh, and so that cost them valuable time. So about 10 to 15 minutes, there's no movement uh, from the Union side. And they get into the crater itself, and at least if you read the accounts, it's, um, you can imagine the scene they encounter. Uh, they begin to start digging Confederates out of, uh, out of the dirt, half-buried soldiers, uh, and there's a great deal of confusion, in large part because there really is no sense of what to expect, and there really wasn't um, a contingency plan once that 4th Division had been removed. Now, uh, something I've always wondered, and, and you've amplified it here, the Union soldiers didn't have a way to, to quickly get out of their own trenches, so mm-hmm. they're not supplied with ladders, presumably. That's right. Then how did they get into the crater when they got over on the other side? If it's 30 feet deep in particular, that's, that's the deepest. And, and that's a difficult question to, to answer because, of course, you know, if you visit the crater today, you know, you're looking at a very small part um, and, and probably not the deepest part. Uh, or, well, definitely not, not the deepest part. So they get in there. Uh, there, is, there are some accounts which suggest it's not so much getting in, it's getting out the other side. I, I should point out that it's not, not a, a sheer slope. That's right. Like and, and that has a lot to do with the actual content of the, of the soil. Um, if you re- <laughs> read the accounts, the soldiers talk about large chunks of the ground being thrown into different directions. So it wasn't, that's right, it wasn't a smooth uh, slope. And so there are places they can get into and get out of fairly easily. Uh, I should point out that I think a lot of us have this image, and I think this has to do most recently with, with Cold Mountain. Cold Mountain, clearly, I mean, there's a lot about that movie that I like, and there's a lot that I don't like in terms of those opening scenes. One of the things I think is dead wrong is just the, uh, how, the, the size of the crater and the depth of the crater itself. Uh, I think it's much too deep. Um, we do know that a couple units, um, union uh, unit, units, do manage to move beyond the actual crater itself. Uh, the problem is that they, they don't move further, and by the time... Uh, there is a final move on the part of Union commanders to perhaps break through because it is a thinly defended salient until around 9, o- nine o'clock in the morning uh, when, Mahone's, um, when, when Mahone's men actually show up and, and really do end any opportunity for, um, for a Union success. Um, so there is opportunity, and, and I, only, I only emphasize that because there is a tendency to see this battle as a sort of inevitable failure. Uh, granted, there's a great deal of confusion in the crater, but um, there is still an opportunity once, um, you know, once the battle actually gets started. So the Union troops pour in, Ludwig's division goes forward, many of them go into the crater, and a few of them push on beyond, but most of them just stand there. That's right. And the problem is, as more federal soldiers move in, and including Ferraro's men eventually, uh, they begin to pack the crater itself. And so really, uh, as time goes on, it becomes more difficult, of course, to organize uh, a continued assault. Um, and I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to suggest that it's, uh, that, that it's, it, it's going to be an easy uh, affair in, in organizing these men. Clearly it's not. And clearly that's the biggest problem they faced that morning. Um, they're all packed in there. And um, once the Confederate artillery uh, are able to uh, get the range, they do a great deal of damage. And especially as Mahone's men uh, begin to counterattack. And, of course, keep in mind, um, and I think this is the most interesting part for me in terms of of, of my research on the crater, uh, their reaction once they realize that the Union uh, attacking force includes a division of of colored soldiers. Uh, That, of course, is uh, an outrage. And, um, and of well, that, course, this is a good point for us to take another break. That's, uh, I think, it's a very interesting point to discuss the Confederate response to the, uh, the crater, both tactically and, as you point out, in terms of the composition of the troops. So we're going to take a short break here on Civil War Talk Radio and return to talk more about the Battle of the Crater with Kevin Levin when we return. Mm-hmm. 